Welcome to Camp Constitution Radio with your host, Hal Shirtliff. This show is heard on WBCQ The Planet every Monday night at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. Also rebroadcast on ipmnation.org on Saturday afternoons at uh, 1 p.m., although that does change. IPM Nation is a uh, online news service that's based out of Concord, New Hampshire. And, of course, WPCQ is shortwave, heard around the world, and the broadcast out of Monticello, Maine, in Arista County. And this show is brought to you by Camp Constitution, which, among other things, runs a week-long family camp. This year's camp is coming right up, July 10th to the 17th, just uh, a few weeks away. We still have room for people if they're interested in attending. And keep in mind, wherever you are in the world or in, in the United States, you can. Um, we'll do our best to help you. We can pick you up at airports, train stations, bus stations, and bring you back. So um, you know, if you're driving in, we do have some folks that are coming in from the Midwest and other parts of the area, so carpooling is possible. Just uh, give me a call, uh, 857-498-1309. And you could, um, you know, we'll, we'll see if we can connect. And if you have any questions about the camp, you can visit our website, campconstitution.net, where you'll find information about the camp and other things. Of course, we have a, um, or it's the Sam Blumenfeld Archives, which we're very proud of. And Sam was a dear friend who uh, bequested his uh, estate or his library to us, and we're making a lot of his. Uh, some of his previous unpublished things make available, as well as his alpha phonics and his, well, we have about 180 audio speeches, a number of videos, and many other great things. So uh, please t- check us out, campconstitution.net. Now we're so hopefully going to have uh, Lord Moncton, Christopher Moncton, on as a guest today, but maybe being in England, uh, it was I couldn't get a hold of him. Uh, we made arrangements to be on today, but anyway, um, the right reason why I wanted him on, well, of course, there's a lot of reasons. He's a brilliant man, and he is one of the top climate change realists. Uh, he has spoken all over the world on the topic and has attended these numerous UN conferences. I had the pleasure of meeting him on a few occasions in New York City, the climate change climate change conference, but it wasn't so much about the global warming issue. It was the fact that England had voted itself out of the European Union. And by the way, if we have any listeners in England, congratulations for doing the right thing for a change. I have English ancestry and I can actually be something to be proud of. There hasn't been much to be proud of, unfortunately, by what's been going on in England for a while, but this is a great thing. And we hope that this will be an incentive to motivate other nations to get out of the European Union and especially getting our nation out of the UN and a death knell to these these trade agreements, partnerships, the transatlantic partnership, the trans-Pacific partnership. So this is momentous. What's really fascinating is, uh, first of all, I didn't think that it would happen. I was just under the impression that England, after three generations of socialism and atheism and all of the other negative things about uh, our Western European culture, that the people were just uh, had a death wish, that they just were going to let the nation be overrun by Muslims and that they would just go sort of go quietly into the night. But their fighting spirit is still there, and I'm so excited to, to see that. And although it was uh, 52% versus 48%, it wasn't like a gigantic margin, but in politics, 4 or 5% is still considered a landslide. And and it's funny, I I pick up the newspaper uh, Monday, uh, not Monday, but the day after the vote, Boston Globe, of course, uh, Europea, England leaves EU, the world shudders. No, I don't think the world is shuddering. I think most people are rejoicing. I think those that are shuddering are the globalists and elitists, the folks that love big government, tyrants, bullies, and bankers. They're the ones that are shuddering. And yes, you'll see that the the pound has lost some of its value, and oh, they're going to be threatening these people with the end of the world. But you know, England's been around a long time. 
They have an economy. They don't need the European Union. The European Union is nothing more than a dictatorship. It's an anti-freedom dictatorship, and it's uh, one of the building blocks of what uh, was referred to as this new world order. In fact, back in, I think it was the spring of 1972, or is it 74, Richard Gardner, writing in Foreign Affairs, had a feature article, The Hard Road to World Order, and you can probably find it easy enough just by going onto the website, and it's there. Many has been reposted by dozens of people. But he said that uh, a frontal assault, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't have the article in front of me, a frontal assault isn't the right way to go. He advocated regional uh, arrangements, regional alliances, and so forth, that would pave the way for a world government. And the European Union was a huge uh, part of that uh, paving the way, regional arrangements. You've got the African Union. You've got uh, all types of these uh, trade, so-called trade consortiums. And in the United States, we have NAFTA. The United States, Canada, Mexico, we have NAFTA. Uh, back in well, between 04 to maybe 07, 08, Bush and his um, handlers were pushing something called the North American Union, the SPP, Security and Prosperity Partnership. Isn't it nice? Yet? These words are so flowery, too partnership, you know, prosperity. Well, what's wrong with that part? I mean, we're all part of this wonderful world. We have so much in common with our Mexican neighbors and our Canadian neighbors that we should just form a partnership and just have one big fat border. After all, we're all part of the same community of man. Isn't that wonderful? Why would we be opposed to this? Well, thankfully, uh, that was defeated. And I I, I wish I could show you my worn-out shoes because all the all the material I delivered to uh, me and of course many others, state houses in the Northwest and the Midwest and the South, uh, alerting elected officials at all levels about the dangers of the North American Union, and you see the uh, globalists are just so arrogant, uh, and I think that's their undoing. In fact, my uh, although I'm not of course I'm not an expert on the situation in England. Uh, I think what may have tipped the scale was the uh, the immigration invasion of uh, Muslims coming into uh, and changing the culture. And it's almost as if the arrogance of these elitists, they said, we, uh, the people in our, these, these European nations, Western European nations that belong to the EU, and there's a few that aren't part of Western Europe, Poland, Lithuania, a few others. Anyway, uh, they... The, the globalists were probably thinking that these people have a death wish. There's nothing they'll do to oppose us. So we're just going to fly, you know, give them the, a verbal uh, or a political middle finger. We're going to flood their nation, their countries, with people who won't assimilate, people who are going to make life miserable for them. And there's nothing they can do about it. And there's nothing they will do about it. But they were wrong. Their arrogance was their undoing. And we just hope that this uh, this will cause a, a groundswell around the world. Uh, I'd like to think that freedom is something that is not just shared by a small minority in mass in in the in, um, United States. I think freedom is something that people want to cherish all over the world if they really understood it. So um, one of the things that uh, what we've been promoting is to get us out of the United Nations. And this is some this is. This would be a big step to see a nation formally leave the UN. As big as the European Union, England leaving the European Union, wouldn't it be great if, if countries start leaving the UN, especially the United States? Because if we get out, the rotten, filthy UN structure would come crumbling down. Now, why do I say that? You see, the U United Nations is uh, nothing more than uh, a world government in the making, just like the European Union was always meant to be a uh, intranational government or regional government. It was, it was sold to the, Amer to the people of Western Europe and Europe as some type of way to uh, ease trade restrictions between, between nations. It would make life better. Everybody would have more opportunities to sell their products or services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But from its infancy, it was set up. In fact, a lot of people think, well, it must have been a bunch of socialists from Europe that got this together. It was launched, the European Union was launched in the United States at the Council on Foreign Relations um, 
John McCoy, David Rockefeller, a little a little consortium. I think David Rockefeller is the only one that's still alive of that original group. And and they sold the Marshall Plan, and of course the Marshall Plan helps further socialize the economies of, of Europe. And the UN was founded right around the same time that this was being hatched, this European Union was being hatched. The United Nations was being founded. Um, they had a meeting in San Francisco. They had a meeting in Bretton Woods, which is in uh, just out of the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And, of course, they had meetings of the IMF in, in, the, at, uh, in New Hampshire. I'm sorry, Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. Uh, Dunbarton Oaks, that's the suburb of uh, Washington, D.C., where they had some early meetings. But the big meeting that got, that got the U.N. started was in uh, San Francisco. It was in uh, late 1945. World War II was just over. And uh, there was delegations from all, all over the world, including, uh, of course, Russia, the United States. And it was led by a man named Alger Hiss. Now, who was Alger Hiss? Alger Hiss was the primary author of the UN Charter. Alger, Alger Hiss was also a spy. He was a Stalinist agent. Now, just think about that. He wasn't just an ideologue. He wasn't just uh, someone caught up in the in the moment or, you know, some misguided ideologue rom and it's interesting how the the left likes to uh, romanticize people who are communists well she, Lucille Ball joined the communist party it was just it was romantic you know or her grandfather he, she's doing her grandfather a favor now Alger Hiss knew exactly what he was doing he was a man of an upper middle class background he went to college when not as many, not that many people went to college he went to one of the nation's Ivy League schools Columbia University that's where he became a communist. You would think that would be the opposite. If you were a communist, you went to a university in the United States that would promote freedom and liberty and, and, and capitalism and the free market. You'd think you'd get a case communism out of them. No, that's where he became a communist and an agent for the most brutal, I should say, the second most brutal dictator in the history of the 20th century. That would be Joseph Stalin. And Hiss was well aware of Stalin's atrocities. And he was the one along with his Soviet uh, counterpart, his name just alludes me at the moment, wrote the UN Charter. And I dare say to people, what good can come out of the writings of a man like Alger Hiss, this traitor to his country? So uh, the UN Charter and the United States, uh, with only two votes in the Senate, supported uh, the UN Treaty. And about the same time, the United States Congress passed an unconstitutional law called the UN Participation Act, saying that any time the UN Security, UN Security Council decides to send its peacekeepers, put that in quotation marks, somewhere in the world, that we have the obligation to send our soldiers. So uh, we no longer declared war since uh, 1941. We haven't, we haven't had a, a real war where the interests of the United States are primarily the concern. And uh, we saw the first UN no-win war in uh, in the Korean War. It was very interesting. I had a uh, friend that was a late friend that was uh, General MacArthur's co-pilot. I'm not co-pilot. I'm sorry, pilot. And he was in the room when Incheon, the, in, the incredible landing of Incheon, was being arranged. And one of his officers made a recommendation that the UN be notified of this uh, plan, this mission, to uh, invade Incheon. It was a very daring move. And MacArthur said something that I can't repeat on a family-friendly radio about the UN. And it was a big success because the Undersecretary for Political and Security Council Affairs at an agreement at Yalta was a Soviet national. And anything that the United States did uh, that went, to, went right to the UN, it went right well, either from the White House to the UN, the UN to Joe Stalin, and Joe Stalin would tip off his friends in communist China. So uh, the, the communist Chinese and the North Koreans did not know about the Incheon, uh, Incheon landing, and it was a big success. So um, the UN peacekeepers, these so-called peacekeepers, have been involved in atrocities. We point to one of the worst ones in uh, Gatanga in the early 60s, the province is now Zaire, had broke away from the central government, which was led by a Soviet-trained uh, communist. Of course, he'd be Soviet-trained. Of course, he's going to be a communist, right? Patrice Lumumba. 
And what did the UN do? See, the UN Charter says that it won't affair, it won't intervene with uh, uh, in, internal affairs. You know, a nation can do whatever it wants within its borders. But they went into this uh, province, this peace-loving province, led by a man named Chombe, Mose Chombe, who, by the way, was a friend of Sam Blumenfeld's, and we I have their their his correspondences up on our Camp Constitution website under the Sam Blumenfeld archive. Well, Chombe, uh, it was a it was a province that was uh, had a had a small but healthy middle class. You had blacks, whites, Jews, Christians, and maybe even a few Muslims living in peace. Yeah, that can happen. When people want to live in peace, they can. And uh, the UN went in, mostly with white troops, by the way, white troops and Indian troops. The white troops were from uh, Ireland, and uh, General Connor Cruz O'Brien, led by him. And they bombed hospitals, and they murdered, massacred, and raped you know, hospitals would have a big red cross on painted on its rooftop. That was a place to drop a bomb, not to avoid bombing, but to drop one. And it was quite a brutal affair. And these things have been going on on a regular basis, time and time again, even up recently. The UN peacekeepers in Somalia, and I use the word peacekeepers, they're not peacekeepers, the UN criminals, gangsters. The UN went into, um, in, into Somalia back in the 90s tortured people. There's a famous picture. You can actually probably do a, a Google uh, search Somali tortured by UN soldiers. You'll see these two white guys in uniform and they're laughing. They think this is fun. They didn't get the memo that you're not supposed to torture people. Or maybe they did get the memo that they are supposed to torture people. And they got this poor soul over a, uh, over a fire. Now I'll tell you something. I served in the U.S. Army. And one of the first things we learned in basic training after we did our marching was that you never obey an unlawful order. And I tell you, torturing is unlawful. You know, we didn't do this to the, uh, the Nazi war criminals. You know, and we shouldn't have tortured. Torturing is a terrible thing. We're supposed to have higher standards, folks. And um, that, that tor- if other people, other governments do it and other nations do it, that's, that's one thing. But the United States is not supposed to do it. Yet we did it, Our, uh, and it was allowed under the UN. Uh, UN soldiers do it all the time. And there's been an Ivory Coast just a few years ago. There was a so-called group of peacekeepers that went in, and uh, they what it was to, it was supposed to take action against uh, these disarmed people to help them. They stood down, but when they uh, the UN soldiers were uh, raping some of the women and some of the children. Um, unarmed people went around this UN compound, and the UN these courageous UN soldiers opened fire on unarmed people. And it's interesting; you didn't hear anything about this in the major media. Al Sharpton didn't say this was a racist crime. Jesse Jackson and all these race hustlers uh, that make a million millions of dollars causing race hatred in the United States didn't say a word about these uh, UN atrocities. And again, these things go on all the time. I'm just trying to think of another. Oh, yes, um, the uh, Rwanda, the massacre in Rwanda between the Tutsis and the Hutus. Um, the UN had a peacekeeping mission. The UN knew all about what was happening. They disarmed, the, uh, they disarmed people, and they promised to help them. And there was one example of this, uh, this poor woman. She said to the UN, some of the UN people, please kill me and my, my children. I'd rather be shot than be hacked to death by these uh, these these um, Hutus, and of course they didn't do that. So uh, close to a million people were massacred in a very short time, and the UN stood by and watched because they warned this to happen. The UN is a monstrous organization, and boy, children around the around the world and here in the United States are being propagandized about how wonderful they are. They have UN UN days. They have model UNs and schools all over the country. I have UNICEF, UNICEF, United Nations International Child, you know, I see, Child I don't know, Relief or something, somewhere in there. This is supposed to help the children of the world be fed and get uh, get medical needs, etc. This is a gang of criminals. They actually had a homosexual, uh, a child abuse ring in its headquarters. I think it was in Brussels, Belgium. And when it was exposed to the world, the reporter who exposed it to the world was the one that was uh, castigated, not the people at the at the UNICEF. 
And it was interesting in the in the uh, what is now Zimbabwe, the communist guerrillas, the terrorists that were murdering people, were found with UNICEF kits. And in other words, UNICEF was supporting the terrorists in uh, Zimbabwe, who of course now run the government. So why are we still in the UN? Why is this obsession with global government? I've heard people say, oh, the UN is just a harmless organization. Oh, they're a waste of time. I really wish that were the case. At the very least, it's a, a lot of money's being wasted. But no, they have missions all over the world. They have a college in Japan. They even monitor the elections of the United States. This is not a harmless organization. It is a dangerous organization. And what they fully want is a world tax, a standing world army. And folks, the United States has been sort of the, the de facto world army because when there's a UN mission, for the most part, the UN soldiers, the United States soldiers are involved. We saw that in Gulf One and Gulf Two and Bosnia, et cetera, et cetera. They, we, we have become really mercenaries or really UN soldiers for the world order. We haven't declared war in, uh, since 1941. We no longer, our U.S. military no longer serves the interest of the American people, the life, liberty, and property of the United States. It serves the interest of the U.N. And it's, it's really hard when I hear people say, you know, you know uh, our, our soldiers are over there defending our way of life and defending our country. I wish that were the case, but it's not and it hasn't been. And I spent a couple of years in NATO uh, thinking that I was sort of here on the, the this is the front line of any potential World War III, when really we were part of a, a, a UN consortium. NATO was a subdivision of the UN. And in fact, NATO uh, was chartered under the UN uh, with the, with the permission of the UN. And so so was the the Vietnam War was fought under the auspices of something called CETO, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. Again, which now defunct, but it was under the UN auspices. Uh, they advocating the Law of the Sea Treaty, the uh, Climate Change Treaties, and many, many other. And look at Agenda 21. Agenda 21 was hatched at the UN, and it's if affecting lives of everyone in our country because local communities are implementing it. Most of them have no idea what they're doing. Because unfortunately, there's a lot of people in this country after several generations of this brainwashing had bought into the idea of global government. Our constitution is obsolete. It's only for a, uh, it was only designed for a agrarian society with a population of a couple of million people. And we need to have something better and something bigger. And because we're, it's 2016, we need to do things differently. A lot of people buy into that. Not just liberals, but a lot of people who call themselves conservatives. Because that's why they want to rewrite the constitution. So the United Nations, is, uh, it's, it's a very dangerous organization. I would say that it's far more dangerous than the European Union, but the European Union was sort of a, a test run. This is how, we, how it's going to be done around the world once the UN has this power. A world court, a world army, a world tax. And the world court, by the way, is a court of original jurisdiction. And thankfully, the United States didn't become part of that. Can you, under, you know, so you will be tried as a, a war criminal. You can go to your local courthouse. You, you're not judged by people that uh, that live in the community. That people have some similar ideas and backgrounds. No, you're brought in front of. Uh, you're brought to another part of the world. That's what a world court is. And in a world court, your job is to prove your innocence. You're guilty until proven innocent. Not the other way around. And who the judges are going to be part of this world court? You're not going to get. As much as I detest the Supreme Court, some of the justices in the Supreme Court, at least sometimes they get it right. Can you imagine a judge from Zimbabwe, a judge from uh, from, uh, from communist China? These are the kinds of people who will be judging under this world court. You see, and the law of the sea treaty. Every time you go go fishing, every time, but oh, this will also mean the U.S. Navy will be, be paying big taxes to the UN. The UN wants to have jurisdiction over all of the all of the water. You know, and, and um, so why are we even giving this a second thought? So people around the country, they really need to start uh, advocating that we get out of the UN. And how do you do it? Well, it's very simple. There's a bill in Congress, uh, H.R. 
2005, I think, and that bill um, will, um, if it's passed, will get us, will get, sir, first at the Congress, and uh, you know, uh, Congress, by the way, can simply, you know, it's, um, it's H.R. 1205, the American Sovereignty uh, Restoration Act, and uh, you can get a hold of your congressman and tell them you want you, them to pass this. Meanwhile, defund the UN. You can simply defund the UN. By just defunding the UN, it's a big step towards um, doing that. In fact, the UN was somewhat defunded back in the 70s, thanks to Larry McDonald and Jesse Helms. They did some kind of way to some parliamentary procedure in Congress, and for a short time, the United States money wasn't going to the UN. In fact, UNICEF, we did pull out of UNICEF, and the so-called conservative George W. Bush reinstated our membership in UNICEF and paid its back dues. Um, and, and let's stop fooling ourselves about these these people that call themselves Republicans and tell you they're for limited government freedom. They are just as much as globalists. In fact, if you uh, if you want to know more about uh, your elected official in Congress, first off, see if they're a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. See if they are pushing free trade agreements. And if they are, there's a good chance that they're internationalists, that they no longer are interested in the um, in, in upholding their oath of office. So they have to be held accountable, hopefully removed and replaced by people who will hold their oath of office seriously. So H.R. 1205, is the uh, the bill number, and when you communicate with your elected official at Congress, you tell them you want this thing passed, and at the same time you want the United States to defund its commitment not just to the UN headquarters, but the peacekeeping missions, so-called peacekeeping, really war-keeping missions is the right word. And I, again, I want to uh, I want to congratulate our uh, our British brethren in Cistern by doing the right thing and getting out of the European Union. And I hope that other nations will follow suit. We'd love to see uh, the European Union fall flat in its face. Since our, our guest, Christopher Moncton, wasn't able to, or I guess our planned guest wasn't able to, to connect, I recommend that if you want to learn, just go go to YouTube and put in Lord Christopher Moncton, M-O-N-C, M-O-N-C, K-T-O-N, I think, and he's a brilliant man. You'll see some of his one incredible presentations. Is uh, he's a genius, and you'll see him refute the climate change uh, people. Uh, he's made a lot of speeches on the evils of global government. He really understands how this works. He's not just interested in climate change. He's in, he, he's looking at the bigger picture. In fact, he was in Minnesota speaking. Was at a college in Minneapolis a few years ago, and he was making a strong appeal for Congress to reject you know, what they call it, the climate change treaty, which they did. He said, this will spell the end of your country if it passes. So he has a really keen understanding, and you, you can learn so much about the issue or the issues and the perspective from his perspective. And I, again, I encourage you, visit YouTube, just do a search for him. And uh, if you go to the Heartland Institute, and he's a lot of his presentations he's given at their events is our, our archive there. Even though uh, the Heartland does a lot of good work, even though so they unfortunately support Article 5 Convention, I encourage, I do like also what they do. And when it comes to this issue, climate change, they do a phenomenal job. Well, thank you for listening. You've been listening to Camp Constitution Radio, WBCQ The Planet. This show is heard on um, every night, uh, I'm sorry, every Monday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So with that, I want to thank you. God bless you. And uh, check us out on the web, campconstitution.net.